So, this is something I've been building up for quite some time. The Last Stand against Saran, against Kill's father. There's been so much going into this, right? And so, let me just break it down a little bit, right? So we've been building up all the way up, and this has been one consecutive narrative starting since the birth of the Syndicate. When Cerebrum and the Executioner attacked Kill and the team, ever since then you have felt the presence of Kill's father. And finally, in this crossover, we got to delve into his character and see what he was about. And I love doing this. So, when it came down to kill his father, his whole entire goal was basically the, this, right? He realized that, you know, kill, you know, has the ability of resurrection, right? Now, it, during the, you know, syndicate hunting down kill's team... Kessler and Matt were killed, right? They were killed, and Kill went through a huge depressing, depression phase where he was just all around sad, depressed, and lonely, right? We got to see Kill at arguably his lowest point in the entire series. And ultimately, it was brought up by Teki to possibly use Kill's blood to use his resurrection process as a way to bring back Kessler and Matt. This is where we slowly see the integration of the idea of the victim serum. Because they get brought back to life. However, when they're all killed again, a few episodes later in the Syndicate crossover, it's brought up that Kill cannot do that again with his own blood. That it just will not allow it. Which is why he needs to fuse with his demon form to become Demon Kill in order to stand a chance against the Syndicate. However... That's a little, you know, a little interesting there. Kill's blood was able to bring back Kessler and Matt. Then, we get into Kill, like, I believe it's titled Kill Saga Night Shift, right? Where we end up seeing this character named Nightmare. And he's a character that's disposed of really fast. But what you find out is that this character, and at the time you may not think this, but this character has huge ramifications for later down the line, in the sense that you hear him state, where is the syndicate, where are their bodies? That's a line that later will become important when we get to the tournament crossover. Because it's like, why is it that this character is so gung-ho on getting the Syndicate's bodies back for the Hero Agency? Why is that the case, right? Now, that is a little weird on its own, right? During the, you know, demon kill, you know, possibly being a little too aggressive thing, we see Kessler and him are not at all, like, they're not on the same side in terms of how they think they should handle criminals and villains, right? So that's in the background, right? Kessler and demon kill having their own little debate, dispute, whatever, right? But during this time, you know, kill gets very cocky. Now, that's a very huge stark contrast from how we initially saw him. He was someone that was very scared during the first crossover. He was someone that wasn't sure of his abilities. But after going toe-to-toe -to -toe and beating Ted, he got a little bit more confidence. Then the Syndicate crossover, it was all holds bar. He was not thinking cocky. He was just trying to survive. However, after getting the power of Demon Kill and beating a team as capable as the Syndicate, you see the kill is extremely cocky. Super cocky to a almost, like, crazy extreme. This leads to the Commando, aka Warzone crossover. And this is where you find out that Commando's wife has been killed, so Commando was sent in to take down the Ultimates, one at a time. Kill being too cocky believes that he can take down any threat by himself because he can rely on his demon form. However, when he goes into this fight, he realizes this is someone with no powers. This is just someone with weapons. So he underestimates him severely, and this leads to him getting defeated and captured because he never uses his demon form against Commando in their first fight. He's just too cocky after the defeat of the Syndicate. Which, you know, Commando then takes him down, and he ends up taking down a majority of the team. Come to find out, in the long run, the members that ended up saving Kill, Kessler, and Ted were Matt and Dr. Nukenvo. Showing that, yes, even though there are some weaker links in terms of Matt, in terms of the team, each member has their own significance. Each member is important. Because if it wasn't for Matt saving Kill, Kessler, and Ted, who knows where they'd be. They probably would be dead at the hands of Commando, and arguably it would have been Kill's fault. 
This begins to humble Kill. As you see, at the end of this crossover, he doesn't rely solely on his demon form to get things done, even though, arguably, his demon form could have easily made quick work of Commando, he doesn't solely rely on it, right? He ends up teaming up with Pillowy, Spider-Ball, Kessler, Ted, and they all take down, you know, Commando. They take him down and bring him to Matt, and this is where they find out they might be on the same side. However, what you also find out in this crossover is that Commando, in order to get information on who killed his, you know, his wife, he had to get blood of the Ultimates, one of them being Kill. This leads into the Victim Serum, which the Victim Serum, you, you don't really see the effects of what it does to its first main victim, but you see that Kill has to take care of him, right? He has to take him down because he was hurting people and he wasn't really conscious of it. But Kill, you know, takes pity on him and says, don't worry, we will find the people responsible for this, right? However, this eventually leads into the Saran crossover, where the Saran crossover, this is where you truly see Kill humbled, but you also see Kill at his breaking point, one of his breaking points. Because at this moment, Kessler betrays the team. He betrays the team for Saran because he is so scared of what Demon Kill can do, he betrays them to Saran so that Saran can go and take care of Demon Kill, now realizing that possibly that could mean the death of Kill as well. Saran goes in and this humbles Kill severely because at this point, no one has been able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Demon Kill. At the end of the day, every single time Demon Kill shows up on screen, instant win for them. Instant. This is the first character in the entire series to ever give Demon Kill a hard time. And after this, he also realizes he went too far because Kessler betrayed them. And so this causes a wedge between them, but this also leads into the tournament crossover where he is forced to team up with Kessler, otherwise they forfeit the tournament. So throughout the tournament, you also see that the team of the, you no, know, no, of the Ultimates, the team of the Ultimates is trying to connect with the Syndicate. These people who came into their house, messed with their brains, tried to hunt them down, tried to literally execute them and massacre them. They're trying to understand them. They're trying to understand where their enemies come from. And they actually end up realizing they're not so dissimilar. They're actually very, you know, similar. You get to find out that Matt and Executioner, they can connect. Matt tries to t you know, talk to him and be like, hey, look, I understand where you're coming from, but people deserve chances. People deserve to you know, atone for their mistakes. Not everyone's perfect. And the Executioner believes, why should I give them a second chance? Why should I let them have that shot? Why shouldn't I just be alone? Because if I be alone, no one can hurt me. But Matt says, but people make mistakes sometimes. And we you know, should allow them to you know, rectify those mistakes, to fix their mistakes, to do better. Which eventually, this does end up getting to Executioner because he believes you should be 100% by yourself. But by the end of this, he realizes that Kessler and Matt were willing to sacrifice their well-being to protect him. This also leads to the, you know, Avalanche and Kessler talking, and you see that Kessler connects with him. This person who killed his entire team and forced Kill to watch him get his neck snapped. Kessler has a heart-to-heart -heart with him and says, you have to be more than just what people want you to be. You have to be you. You have to be yourself. You can't just listen to what other people want. And you find out that Avalanche and Kessler are not so you know dissimilar either because Kessler was in a much very similar situation with his father. His father wanted him to be basically this bad guy, this robber, and he wanted him to kill a nine-year-old child so that they could escape. But instead, Kessler, not knowing what to do, accidentally killed his father and saved the kid. This is basically two of the same characters because Avalanche is basically if Kessler ended up killing that kid. Which is a big deal. It's a huge deal. But then you see Kill and Cerebrum, two characters who at this point in time are very dark characters. Kill is not the same person that he was at the beginning of the Kill Saga. He is someone who is confused, someone who doesn't know how to be a leader, someone who, you know, is still learning, someone who is scared, is afraid, but also is cocky and, 
you know, releasing this fear on other people. Cerebrum is much the same way. Cerebrum is very much cocky, arrogant, but he also uses fear to control his enemies, and even in some cases control his teammates. Cerebrum is basically, if Kill, at this moment in his life, didn't have people like Kessler and Matt to tell him he was going too far, he was doing the wrong thing. This is basically Kill if he had no friends. And they all end up having this joint, com you know, this joint community, this joint, like, friendship and, you know, companionship. And they all team up to take down Saran. And at the end of the day, they still lose, but they all connect in a different way and become a united team. And this eventually leads into the comedy skits that take place afterwards to show you them connecting. And this eventually also leads into the Puppet Master, where you find out that the Supreme Director has issued out a hit for certain members of the team. He ends up sending out Saran to take down and kill the Grandmaster because the Grandmaster has the ability to resurrect people if he wishes. He can warp reality. So he sends Saran in to kill the Grandmaster. He sends in the Puppet Master to kill Matt. And he sends Duplicate, a character who can duplicate, to kill Commando and Techie. Eventually, the team does stop them, but they fail to stop the death of the Grandmaster. After this, this leaves the team in a very broken state where they just don't know if they can handle the power of Saran because he killed someone as powerful and capable as the Grandmaster and they had nothing they could do to stop it. This eventually leads to Kill's own tech his bracelet that he's depended on during the tournament that made him more powerful at the expense of his resurrection process and his axe that he's had since day one, both of those are destroyed. While he tries to protect Commando and the Executioner, both of those are destroyed by Saran. And this leads to Demon Kill showing a revelation. Kill has you know, control over Paradition, Purgatory. He can control it because that's his resurrection process. So with the power of Perdition and Hellfire, they come together and they make new weapons for Kill to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Saran. And this eventually leads into the finale. This is where we see all the closure come together. So, let's start off one by one. Let's start off with the characters, right? In terms of Kill's father, we'll begin there. Kill's father explains that the reason as to why he ended up killing Kill's mom was because of the fact that basically he was envious she had something that he could never attain. And so what he basically said was, you know, for lack of a better uh, phrasing, because I don't remember exactly what he said, he basically said, let down your powers so I can hurt you like I wish I could hurt our child. And if you let me hurt you, then I will not hurt our child. And what he ends up doing is he ends up killing her when she lets down her powers. This, you know, obviously gets help, you know, it gets kill pissed. And this also shows how dark this character is. He admits to basically creating the victim serum, which obviously led to characters like John Henderson, you know, being, you know, experimented on. So this character created the victim serum and his goal is to basically use the victim serum to cloud the earth to kill everyone on Earth and resurrect them, but without their negative inhibitions. You know, they're basically going to be walking clean slates. They're going to be under his control. He's going to be basically, you know, coding these people to be as he wants, like they're mindless zombies. He's going to basically create a utopia under a dictatorship. A dictatorship in which they will not fight. They will not have free will. Kill realizing this obviously is at odds with him. Not to mention that this character has also been using his power of the hero agency to kill the heroes of the hero agency and resurrect them over and over and over again. To keep killing them over and over and over again for Saran. Saran's been killing these heroes with the help of the Supreme Director over and over again to boost his powers. Which explains how he goes from someone who can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Demon Kill to someone in the tournament who could destroy the entire team to then later being able to destroy the Grandmaster. It explains how he keeps getting more and more powerful because Saran's powers increase with each kill that he does of a superpowered being. 
So basically, they're trying to make Saran omnipotent by constantly killing heroes over and over and over again and constantly reusing them by using the victim serum. So not only would the Supreme Director have control of the entire planet if he did this, but he also would have the strongest and most powerful being in the universe right by his side. You know, it's not the only thing that's crazy about this um, crossover, right? We also have to talk about, you know, in my opinion, the three biggest deaths of this crossover, right? We'll start from the first one, the Executioner. The Executioner has been someone since day one that's someone that's just cold, calculated, gets the job done. That's how it's been. When he first showed up, he was just in a uniform, head to toe covered, hiding himself away, did his job, got it done. That's how he's been in every single interpretation. Except when Matt started talking to him. He started trying to connect with him, trying to show him there's a different way. Kessler protected him during the tournament. Showed him, not everyone's not going to want to protect you, right? And eventually during, you know, uh, Stealth Ops, you know, Kill Saga Stealth Ops, you see the Commando and Executioner start developing this friendship. They start developing this little friendship that's blooming from, you know, them taking down these terrorists. And they start connecting. Then you see in Lions then that at this point Commando and you know the Executioner are a little closer and Commando's doing his best to protect the Executioner from what Saran is capable of. Over the course of a bunch of episodes you see how it is that the Executioner has been changing slowly. He goes from a rugged tough guy kind of character to someone who when he sees that Matt's in danger because Matt ends up blocking the sword of Saran to save Executioner's life with his hammer. When Matt is about to die, the Executioner, without hesitation, lays his life down to save the person that showed him there is another way to handle these kinds of friendships or relationships. There is another way. These people do deserve redemption. They deserve a second chance. And this was the Executioner's second chance, and he saved Matt's life. I think that was a perfect way to end that character's character arc, in my opinion. Then we get to Avalanche, someone who from day one has been the puppet of the Supreme Director, of the Hero Agency, of his own family. And he's been someone who can't make his own decisions for himself, someone who is stuck in the mindset of, I have to do what they request because they're my family, right? And with this in mind, Kessler connects with him and shows him, hey, there is another way to handle this. There is another way to go about this, right? And Kessler connects with him. And they, when they connect, they're just showing him there's a different way. And during, you know, some multiple episodes, you see Avalanche is slowly loosening up, trying to find his voice, trying to be his own person. And you see him become his own person in Kill Saga Fall of the Grandmaster, where he ends up risking his own life against the wishes of Teki and the orders of Teki. He, he tries to sacrifice his own life to save the Grandmaster. He gets in there and says, I can't stay on the sidelines anymore. And he goes in. The biggest problem about Avalanche is that he could never say no to people's orders. He always followed their orders down to a T. And he said no to Teki. And he got in the way of Saran and tried his best to save the Grandmaster. This eventually leads to the crossover of The Last Stand. Where you see that Matt is telling Avalanche, we're getting massacred. We're getting destroyed. I don't think this is someone we can beat. I really don't. I don't think we can win against Saran. I think what we should do is be strategic and escape because we didn't think he was going to be this powerful. We should escape while we can and try to regroup, try to get other people back here so we can stand a better chance against Saran. And Avalanche, looking at him, realizes that Matt might be right, but him seeing the kill is about to die. The kill is literally on fumes, being able to barely stand against Saran. He says, I can't do that. And he gets in there, saving Kill's life, beats the fuck out of Saran. Beats the absolute shit out of Saran. And at the end of the day, you see that Saran starts to choke him. It's very similar to how Avalanche was choking Kessler back in the original Syndicate crossover. And all you hear is Avalanche say the exact same words that Kessler said to Kill. When Kessler was being choked out by Avalanche in the Seneca crossover, what Kessler said back then was, I'm sorry, Kill, we tried. But this time, Avalanche says, I'm sorry, Kill, I tried. 
And in both instances, Kill was helpless to do anything. He couldn't do anything. In the first mo in the first crossover with the Syndicate, Kill, his brain was fried. He couldn't move his limbs. This time, he's frozen with fear because he knows if he moves any closer, Saran will kill Avalanche. And so Kill in both instances wants his ally to be dropped. But in both instances, their necks are snapped. Avalanche dies the exact same way as he killed Kessler in the Syndicate crossover. And he basically just, in the end, he got the admiration of Kill and the Ultimates for sacrificing his life to save them. It shows you how far this character has come, because at the end of the day, he went from someone who neck Kess you know, he snapped Kessler's neck just because he could. And now he was scared and he was alone, but at the end of the day, he got the respect and the love and the admiration of the Ultimates, and he sacrificed his life to save them. And last but not least, Kill. This one was probably the hardest death to film. You see Kill, you know, throughout this, he's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Saran, and he is, he is struggling. This is a hard fight. And as they're fighting, you see that it gets bloodier and bloodier and bloodier, and eventually Saran gets the upper hand, stabs him, stabs him, stabs him, but you see that Kill remembers what the Grandmaster said. The sword, it's the only way. And he ends up using his teleportation because now the sword doesn't burn Kill anymore because Kill is no longer a demon. That after, he, after Kill found out that Demon Kill was his brother, they merged powers, but now Kill is no longer a demon. This allowing Kill to teleport the sword without being burnt. And Kill ends up taking down Saran once and for all. And when Kill ends up dying, he ends up saying goodbye to everyone and says how much he's going to miss them and that, you know, it's just different this time, that he is going to die because he went to 100% on his ring to save everyone. It's time to and move on. And as he dies, just, he goes into it's paradition time for a new face. And, and he sees his mom. And the only thing he can say is, the birth did I do good? Of the Kessler saga. This entire series. And I hope you guys enjoy that. He's been hating himself, blaming himself for her death, blaming himself for everything that ever happened to her. In Kill Saga Paradition, he was in purgatory, grieving over her loss, saying basically that it was his fault. When he was confronted by his dad, he told him, when it comes to her forgiveness, that would be up to her to decide. He never knew if he was worthy for her love anymore. He didn't know if he was worthy to be her son anymore. But in that moment, when he finally gets to hug her again, he asks her the question, did I do good? Because he genuinely doesn't know. And what she tells him is, I couldn't ask for more. And that is the end of Kill's story. Kill ends up going into the light, and he's gone. And... This ends with the Kill Saga realizing it's time to move on. It's time to take on a new face. It's time for the Kessler Saga to rise. And I hope you guys enjoy.